gave us in a read for us. Exodus chapter 26, verses 15 through 30. Thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle, shit of wood standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenons shall there be in one board, set in order one against another. Thus so shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle. Twenty boards on the south side, south. And thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, there shall be twenty boards, and there are forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. And the two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides. And they shall be coupled together beneath, and they shall be coupled together above the head of it unto one ring. Thus shall it be for them both. They shall be for the two corners. And they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards at the side of the tabernacle for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from end to end. And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold, and make the rings of gold for places for the bars, and thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was showed thee in the mount. Father, as we open your word and reveal Christ to us in every verse. Without Christ's sacrifice, none would be saved. Be with Ken today as he preaches your message. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, this is the scripture portion that we have. To consider today as we've been looking at the various aspects of that tabernacle in the Old Testament that the Lord gave Moses instruction to build. And I know when you're just reading some of these things, you may get lost in the detail of them. But as we've seen, every detail has a significance, particularly with regard to the person in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the way that this is described as we've been following it here in Exodus chapter 26, the detail starts with the outside of the tabernacle and then works inward. And so you can imagine here in the middle of the camp of Israel where the 12 tribes are all around this tabernacle it was an oblong shape and yet the Lord had purposed that this be where his name should dwell and people passing by just looking at the outside wouldn't have necessarily seen any difference because remember we saw last time that top layer of the tabernacle was made of badger skin and that's what the people took to make their own tents. So if they were looking from the outside at this tabernacle, it would have looked just like the covering of the tents of the people around. And yet, oh, how much more significant it was as you work down inside and see the structure of this tabernacle and the significance of the pieces of furniture that were in it and we'll be describing, we've already seen some of that in our past, but as we get on down to the particular veil that was in that tabernacle and the Ark of the Testimony, the mercy seat, this is where once a year the blood was brought in on the Day of Atonement, sprinkled on that mercy seat, all of these being types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd encourage you, to maybe go out on the internet and actually look at a draft 
of what this tabernacle must have looked like. There are a number of them out there that you can look at and see, and if that helps you visualize it a little better, that's not idolatry, that's just a picture. If you were to sit down and actually draw a picture of what we've described here, you would be able to perhaps visualize a little better what this tabernacle would have looked like. But what we're going to consider today in these verses 15 to 30 really has to do with the undergirding. Because, again, just looking at the tabernacle to a passing eye, it would have looked somewhat feeble. Somewhat of a structure that at any given time a wind come and blow it away. But oh, how wrong you would be to think that that's what this was. It's like, again, because it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's really the title of this message, God's Tabernacle with Men. John, in his gospel, spoke of the word that was with God, the word that was God from the beginning, and the word was made flesh and dwelt. That little word dwelt that he wrote about there in John 1.14 is the word tabernacle. That he, God, actually tabernacled among men. And that's why it was important here when this instruction was given to Moses in Exodus 26 and verse 30, where he said, Thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was showed thee in the mount. So this was revealed to Moses how this was to be built. And then he was to go and assure that every detail of how this was built would be exactly according to the pattern. Such is the perfection of Christ. There wasn't one aspect of Christ being in the flesh that was out of joint or somehow just a little bit off measure. We know how that is. We can start off with the best of intentions to build something, especially if you want me to build it. That's why I hire a carpenter. I hire somebody else to do it because anybody that's seen my projects know that when it's done, you're going to stand back and look at it kind of think, well, no, it doesn't quite look like it's lining up the way it should. And if you put a level to it, sure enough, it's going to be off somewhere. But this is the beauty of this tabernacle, that the Lord so gave this ability to those that built it among the priests. They were the ones that were called upon to put together this tabernacle under Moses' supervision. That in the end, even though it was a temporary structure, because they were picking it up, taking it down and moving it, but even in that there was order that every one of the sons of Aaron had their specific task that they were to do. And I can imagine the day that when the Shekinah glory started moving away from the mercy seat, that was indication they were getting ready to move because the Lord's presence was there in that cloud of glory. And you can imagine that as that began to move, it was time to pack up and follow wherever that cloud would lead. And every one of those priests had their instruction, what was to be taken down first to last, and then carried on the shoulders of those priests until the Lord, the cloud stopped, and they knew it was there that they were to put it up again, not knowing exactly how long the Lord would have them stay there. We know that this was the case for 40 years there in the wilderness. And this is where God had purposed to manifest his presence among them in such a visual way. And yet, when you look at it, you think, in a tent? But that was the same reaction of people when they saw Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. And they looked at him and wondered, how could this be God with us, as he was declaring? Because their eyes had been blinded, they couldn't see but what a beauty it is, even as Brother Robert read there in Hebrews chapter 9, to be able to go and read how every one of those details was fulfilled in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what I want us to see here 
This is not just about boards and buildings or sockets, but the view that we have here is that the structure with which this tabernacle was built, in other words, the foundation on which it was laid is a beautiful picture of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, his work is visualized in the altars that were there and the sacrifices, but here particularly in the structure, the framing, we all know that that's key to a solid building, isn't it? It's how the foundation is laid. You don't take that for granted. Be careful, the scriptures say, how you build on that foundation. That's what he said through Paul there to preachers in 1 Corinthians 3. There's one foundation that has been laid, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so those that preach are careful. We're not going back and re-laying the foundation. It has been laid already. The gospel I have to preach for you is declaring unto you a foundation that has already been laid. In the Old Testament, in type, in picture, prophecy, New Testament, the fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that foundation has been laid, but I need to be careful how I build on that foundation. Not with wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble is what preachers do when they bring in their own thoughts. They bring in their own interpretations. And especially if they bring in something that man has to contribute. Nothing, that is nothing but wood, hay, and stubble that the Lord will take and devour with his fire fiery trial, but to build on that foundation with the gold and silver and precious stones, which is what the coverings were of the different furniture that was in this tabernacle, represented the, the very character of God and his glory and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of that is significant. But coming back here to my text, and what I want us to see when you talk about these boards and these sockets and how they're all put together, we see that a, it represents a solid foundation in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what makes me joyous to be able to stand here and to preach to you a sure gospel and a sure Savior that came into this world in the flesh, tabernacled among us, and yet was none less than God in the flesh, regardless of how men see it. So let's come back here to verse 15 to begin with. You can see here that the instruction that was given to Moses was that he would make boards for the tabernacle made of shittim wood. As we've seen already, this was a type of acacia tree. And as I've mentioned before, this acacia tree was particular to that particular part of the world, especially in the wilderness. It was a tree that could grow up in a very dry place and yet be a hard wood, a tree that, that had life in it. And yet that tree was to be taken and cut down and boards made out of that tree as the very foundation or framework of this tabernacle. Do you not see how that picture of the acacia tree growing up as a root out of dry ground is the way Isaiah wrote about it in Isaiah 53 is a description, had life in itself. You look all around, I've, I've traveled different places of the world in desert places and all of a sudden you see some plants or trees that are growing in that desert place and you marvel how is it that they have any sustenance at all but the Lord has put them there and it's as if life is in itself they draw the the very water and nutriment needed in order to exist from itself what a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ that came into this world and that lived in a wilderness 
as a root out of dry ground, having life in himself. But think also of that tree being cut down. They didn't just go to a local lumber yard there in uh, somewhere in the, the wilderness and pick out these boards. The, this acacia wood tree would have had to have been cut down and then cut in pieces exactly as God had purpose in order to frame this tabernacle according to the specifications that the Lord gave. Do you not see even in that a picture of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ being cut down and that that wood from that tree serve as the very foundation, the framework of this tabernacle? Now each board then was made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. That's the way these were made. And it says 10 cubits will be the length of the board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. A cubit is just about a foot and a half. I kind of round it up the way I do in math. So you're talking about a, a you know, half yard, 18 inches, maybe 17, 18 inches in there. So whenever you want to transpose that 10 cubits, just think half as far as what, what it would be in, in yards or inches. So this particular board here, when it says 10 cubits shall be the, the length of a board and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one of the boards, we're looking at something here that would be somewhere around 15 feet long or high, if you will, and uh, two or two feet, three inches wide. You can, you can uh, kind of picture what that would be in your mind's eye. And so here were to be, as you read on, 20 boards for the south side, and the north and south sides of the tabernacle had 20 boards each, as we continue to read there. Two tenons shall there be in one board set in order, one against another, and thus shalt thou make for all the boards of the tabernacle. Thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle 20 boards on the south side, southward, and thou shalt make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, there shall be 20 boards. So you're talking about symmetry here whether it was the north side, the south side, that these were to be the same boards and the same length. And then, in addition, it speaks there, the 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under one board and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. So 20 north and south, but westward was to be six boards with two corner boards, it says, thou shalt make six boards, and two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle and the two sides. So it's just describing how this was to be laid out in its design. And again, what's the purpose for all this? When it talks about these tenions, these uh, have to do with, actually, the word is, is tabs or rings. And each board then was to be joined together by this system of rings through which would run bars. And again, you say, well, what would be the purpose of those bars? That would be for the purpose of carrying these boards. Every part of it was to be sanctified unto the Lord so that no part of it was man to be touching these things. You don't just pick up the board and carry it. These had these these rings in them. Each board had four rings through which the bars would run. And then the corner boards, as we saw there, had eight rings, four on two sides to accommodate the corners. And so running this bar through would, would be something not only for carrying it, but would add uh, structure to the boards to keep them together. And uh, these were not nailed together. We don't read here anywhere where they took nails and pounded these boards together. This was be, to be put together in this fashion so that in the end, it was a solid framework. When I think of people nailing 
hammering nails, I'm thinking, man, add his part to it, which no part of it depended upon man. All of this was of God's doing. And so it says there would be eight boards with their sockets of silver and 16 sockets. As you read on in verse 24, they shall be coupled together beneath. They shall be coupled together above the head of it into one ring. Think about when you're reading this, the unity of all these different parts and yet forming one structure. I think about all the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ and many, many of them hidden to the visible eye because when you talk about this structure being built, this was not something that people from the outside could even look upon or see. And yet it's what made that tabernacle to be what it was as a solid structure and uh, in essence immovable against any sort of wind or other adversity that might come up against it. Do you not see how that's a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ? In the flesh, yes, maybe to men looking weak in the flesh, and yet so many of those hidden attributes of God in the flesh that men could not see, and yet that's what upheld our Lord Jesus Christ as he was on this earth as a man. That in every way, no matter what the adversity that was brought against him, it could not bring him down. He was that sinless savior, even in taking upon him the contradiction of sinners against himself. And yet, how, how solid was that frame work of God in the flesh. That's what was necessary. If it had been left up to any of us, there would be no salvation. That's why God sent his son in the fullness of the time. And uh, he was made under the law made of the, of the seed of the woman, made under the law, to redeem those that were under the law. There's a picture here of what this tabernacle represented. One ring, it says in verse 24, thus shall it be for them both, and they shall be for the two corners, and they shall be eight boards and their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under one board and two sockets under another board, and so thou shalt make bars of shittim wood. That's the bars that would go through. They too made up this shittim wood. It was a durable work, wood, but again, had to be cut down as a picture of Christ. Five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the boards shall reach from end to end and thou shalt overlay the boards with gold. So here again is another picture of Christ in the flesh because the shittim wood represents God in the flesh, but overlaid with gold represents his divinity. Christ did not cease being God when he came into this world in the flesh. Just the opposite. He took on flesh a body had been prepared for him, but he in no way ever ceased being God. And that's what that gold represents here, that these boards being overlaid with gold and made their rings of gold, their places for the bars, and thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. Gold's heavy. And you can imagine this structure that we're looking at here and the gold that was overlaid, that overlaid this framework, it would have been, again, what gave strength, if you will, to the shittim wood. If it had been just shittim wood, then there may have been possibly some weakness in it. But the fact that this was overlaid with gold did nothing but strengthen the shittim wood. You not see in that a type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, what was it that strengthened him and upheld him while he was on this earth as a man? It was none other than his divinity. I liken the picture of an altar 
where you have the rocks that represent the altar, and then you have the wood and the sacrifice that's put on top of that altar. When the fire was lit, it would burn the wood and the sacrifice, but would leave the altar unaffected. Well, I see a beautiful picture there that the altar on which the sacrifice was laid was none other than the divinity that represents the divinity of Christ. That could not be destroyed. When Christ died on the cross, God did not die. But the man died. That's what the sacrifice represents. The man, Christ Jesus, he's the one that was delivered up. It was necessary that a body be prepared him so that blood could be shed because God can't die. But were he a mere man, that would not have satisfied a holy God. Man in and of himself cannot satisfy God. Only God can satisfy God. And therein is the mystery of godliness, of which Paul wrote to Timothy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And what a beautiful sight when we consider all of this, that everything that was put together and framed here, and here we see that, that uh, foundation that is laid both with uh, not only the shittim wood, but the gold that the boards were covered in. All of this represents the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the foundation of the tabernacle, which was made and uh, in which we now look to as Christ being the fulfillment, having come in the flesh and worked out that salvation that God might indeed be just to justify. If you look over in Ephesians chapter 2, and I hope this gives us just a little better picture of why all of this detail was necessary. But in Ephesians chapter 2, the same sort of language is used here when we begin in verse 20, describing the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some will ask, well, does the tabernacle represent Christ or does it represent his church? The answer is yes. <laughs> you can't separate Christ from his church. His church is that people that God the Father gave him from eternity. That's who the Bible calls the elect, their elect of God. This is not man's choosing. This was done even before there was even a first man created. Christ was there in eternal union with his father. And when you talk about God having chosen a people from before the foundation of the world, it's because Christ was already there as the savior who was to be honored of his father in being given a people for whom he would then come and work out their salvation. It wasn't finished in eternity. It was appointed in eternity, but in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem those that were under this law. And that law includes not only the precepts of the law, but even the types and pictures that we're seeing here. He was made under the law so that now when we come back and look at the Old Testament law, we can see how this was fulfilled in Christ. I remember days when I used to read the Old Testament and think, oh, hold on, because it just seemed like an, a, like pulling an old book off the library shelf and dusting it off and starting to read through and think, what on earth is all of this? But when it pleased God to reveal Christ in me, and then I read portions of Scripture like after Christ's resurrection when he was walking with his disciples on the road to Emmaus and opened their eyes and they could see how everything, because he, he started with Moses and the prophets and showed them of the things that he was to suffer. And when their eyes were open and the Lord passed on, you remember what they said, did not our hearts burn within us? I'll tell you, that's where all of scripture now becomes just a living book. I'm talking about Genesis all the way to Revelation. People have their little favorite portions of scripture and they kind of like to 
camp down there, but I'm telling you, keep reading until the Lord opens your eyes to see Christ. And camp there, even like portions like this. Take your time and go back and forth between the New and the Old Testament because it's all one book. Just like there was one frame work of the tabernacle. There's one word it's pertaining to Christ. Everything in it pertains to him. And that's what we see here in Ephesians chapter 2 where in verse 20 it speaks of these and particularly writing the Ephesians. They were Gentiles. They weren't even raised under the law as the Jews had been. And yet Paul was sent to to be a light to the Gentiles, to preach Christ to the Gentiles. That's why the Jews got jealous. They didn't want him going and preaching from Old Testament scriptures about the Messiah and apply it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Perish the thought. They were looking for another Messiah. They'd already turned thumbs down on this one. And yet, that's why Paul preached to the Gentiles, because it was foreordained that there be a people brought to God from every tribe, nation, and tongue for whom Christ had already paid the sin debt. And them he must bring. That's our confidence. That's my confidence, even in preaching the gospel. I don't know who God has chosen and who he hasn't, but I'm laying it out there. And I'll tell you this, if one has been chosen of God and Christ has already paid their sin debt, the time will come when the Spirit of God will open their eyes. And guess what? They're going to see the same Christ as has been revealed to any one of those that are members of his church already. And that's who he's describing here. We'll go up to verse 19 of Ephesians 2. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. He's talking about them as Gentiles being outside the commonwealth of Israel. But he says they're fellow, fellow citizens with the saints. When you see that word saints, it's not talking about saintly people. Now this one is more saintly than that one. There are no degrees of holiness. Anybody that preaches that somehow you're progressing in holiness, they haven't understood holiness and they haven't understood depravity. Now here, when it says that you are fellow citizens with the saints, that word saints is the sanctified ones, those that have been justified already in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be a saint. And it's the same for all, notice, fellow citizens, whether Jew or Gentile. If you're one of these for whom Christ has paid the debt, then there is that fellowship already. And it says of the household of God. How many households of God are there? There's only one. People today like to divide up the scriptures and they say, well, there's one household for now for the church. But then at the end of time, Christ is coming back. He's going to take the church out in some sort of secret rapture. And you've heard all those stories. Left behind, all of a sudden, oh no, there's a pot of clothes and someone got taken out. Where are they? Planes crashing, the pilot was a Christian, the plane went down. All this nonsense you find nowhere in Scripture. There's only one household of God. Always has been. That is that people that God has chosen, whether Jew or Gentile. You realize there were elect Gentiles in the Old Testament that were brought into the, into the fold that are part of that household of God? How about Ruth from Moab of all places? How about Rahab the harlot? Those were, those were not Jews, those were Gentiles. Even Abraham, that's what Paul told the Jews when he said, well, we have as our father Abraham. Well, guess what? When God called Abraham, he was still an uncircumcised Syrian. But of the household of God, of that one that God had purposed to build through all time. And that's the blessed, that's the one structure. That's why I ask, well, when you talk about the tabernacle, are we talking about Christ, are we talking about the church? Yes, because Christ from eternity has ever been identified with this people that the Father has given, and that's why he came to this earth in the flesh. But that's what we read in verse 20, are built upon not the foundations, 
but the foundation, one foundation of the apostles and prophets. You say, well, what, why the apostles and prophets? Well, because that was their message. That's what Moses was declaring back there in the Old Testament among the prophets. All the prophets spoke of this one foundation. All the apostles, one foundation. Just like one framework for that tabernacle, Christ in the flesh, God in the flesh, tabernacle among men, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Even in the tabernacle, those little corner pieces that are mentioned there with detail, that's describing the, the, the person of Christ as the chief cornerstone. Everything goes from there. That's how the whole foundation is lined up based on that cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And notice here in verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Fitly framed. If you don't get anything else out of this message, you'll go back there and read what we've been reading here in Exodus 26. Think of fitly framed. That every detail put together to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ, fitly framed. He's the fit man. He's the fit high priest. He's the fit tabernacle. Fitly framed together. Notice, unto a holy temple in the Lord. Whose holiness is it? It's his holiness. Every, every part with the gold, every part of that tabernacle was unto, was a holy temple unto the Lord. No holiness of man but all the holiness in Christ. That's why he's the, the fit substitute for sinners. And it says, verse 22, in whom you also are built together. See what I said? You can't separate the two. Does the tabernacle represent Christ? Yes. Does it represent his church? Yes. Fitly framed together. In whom? That's the part I want us to see. It's not in what. It's not what we know or what we perceive in whom salvation is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom you also are builded together. The sense there in the tense is that already built together. We're just seeing the outworking of it as the Lord brings different ones to Christ for whom Christ has paid the debt and, and God has already chosen them, but the building because it represents the Lord Jesus Christ, is already there. The foundation has already been laid for a habitation of God through the Spirit. How is it that we enter in? It's by the Spirit of God. You see, the, the work of salvation described there is the work of a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father who did the purposing and laying out the design, the Son executing, exactly what was purposed of the Father and the Spirit revealing in time and showing us that the salvation is not of us, but of him. What a blessed portion of scripture for us to consider. And that's why in verse 30 there, the Lord said to Moses, make sure that you build this according to the pattern which you were shown on the mountain, the pattern because it pertained to the Lord Jesus Christ. And every part of that was to his honor and glory alone. All right.